early 1980s, uh, I had done some mineral research as to trying to find large spear deposits of silica. It was an extensive undertaking into doing uh, geological studies and, and uh, talking with the Department of Geology and other timber people who were in and out of the woods in different areas of Southern Oregon. Uh, and they had indicated that uh, at this particular geographical location that there was a whole lot of white rocks, as they put it. And uh, so I continued to, to study and to, to search out the area and finally zeroed it down to locating this. The claims consist of about 460 acres of uh, mineral holdings. And uh, it's one of the largest silica deposits uh, west of the Rocky Mountains. And filed on these claims uh, under the mining laws of the United States and uh, have had them in my possession since uh, uh, early 1985. We were uh, told by the regulatory agencies that we had to have a, an approved plan of operation and we went through all of the appropriate filings to do that. Uh, there was an extensive amount of, of time and effort on the regulatory agencies to do their environmental studies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it became very apparent very quickly that there was a whole other agenda behind this. The, the federal mining law state very clearly that the regulatory agencies are to aid and assist in mineral development, and that's part of the mining law. And I can tell you from first-hand experience, it has been anything but aiding and supporting uh, the development. When once you apply for a plan of operation, uh, the law says that they have to give you an answer within 30 days and then that that's to be approved within a 60-day period of time. And we've been 24 years trying to get this project up and, up and going and it's been in and through delays. Uh, they have claimed they had to do this study and that study. It's been uh, archeological studies, it's been fish and game studies, it's been air pollution studies, it's been hydraulic studies. And the sad thing about that whole concept, none of that applies here. We're not next to any river, we're not next to any lake, we're not in, close to, we're 12 miles from a major highway here. We don't have any water pollution problems with this. Your filtration sand that's in your water treatment plant down in, in Medford is made from silica sand, the very thing people are fighting, the very thing they depend upon to get clean water every day. Instead of the, the regulatory agencies of saying yes or no, whichever the case is, they never say no, but they won't say yes either. And their no is implemented by virtue of a constant delay. Their intent, and which has worked in many instances, of, of, uh, to wear you out, to discourage you simply by attrition, put you through the hoops, put you through the, the meat grinder, if I can use that term. And they use that and have learned to use that method very effectively. They have done everything that they can to stymie this operation that has high paying jobs, that the end product is what every one of us need and use on a daily basis. And, you know, if you brush your teeth, you use a silica product. If you drink out of a drinking glass and telephones and cell phones and computers and on and on and on. We identify much with the timber industry who's been subject to the same type of roadblocks and stumbling blocks and excuses and legal maneuvers, whatever. Uh, but we've just, we have a legal team that's done years of study into the mining law, and uh, so we're very, very close to implementing those steps necessary to get this, this valuable resource uh, up and in production and get people put back to work. This property was uh, originally mined uh, in the mid-1800s, and I came along in the late 80s and remined it. One of the key factors in uh, mining uh, at the time that I did it was reclamation. Prior to that, uh, most of the mining was done without the knowledge of what uh, the effects of mining in the 1880s would have on the environment. 
We had to lay out a reclamation plan uh, before we started mining, which included what would the land look like when we got done with it. And our goal was to put it into a series of ponds that would benefit uh, the wildlife and uh, enhance the stream flow and make a beautiful area for local people to come and, and have recreation. This project was actually unique and the original reclamation plan was to level this and plant trees. Well, what I had observed is a lot of small trees that the tops had died and it was because there wasn't any nutrients in the soil. So uh, I proposed to the county, who is the landowner here, Josephine County, that we get creative and do something different. And it took a while, but eventually they agreed. So then we did, laid out about 11 ponds, which included uh, shallow areas, uh, for certain animals and uh, deep areas where fish could live year round when the water gets warmer. And uh, so the habitat that we saw is a series of ponds and trails running through them. And, uh, and of course the, the big issue is water. And these ponds are designed to uh, fill up in the winter and catch the rain, keep it from running off. And then during the dry season, the water will uh, slowly seep out. Um, but when it gets halfway down, the rest of the pond was sealed so that it would never go completely dry and would become habitat for western pond turtles and different types of fish and frogs and beavers and muskrats uh, throughout the whole year. That was our goal. Uh, it was a simple plan, but it is, years later now, it is still working. I grew up in a small logging town. Everybody that I knew made their living by either working in logging or working in the sawmill. And later on I got involved in mining. And My great-grandfather was a miner, my grandfather was a miner, my dad did some mining. Uh, I did some mining with my son. Uh, and uh, so we have a long history of being connected to the industry of logging and the industry of mining. But I look at myself as an environmentalist. I'm not opposed to regulations, especially when it comes to mining and logging. Uh, but we need to have a balance that allows us to protect the environment and to make a living by logging and mining. And I'm uh, convinced that it can be done and we can do it with far fewer regulations than what we have. Uh, there are just so many regulations that it makes it almost impossible to harvest trees properly or to uh, get the resource of gold in the ground and make a living out of it. I've been mining for about 30 years. Uh, approximately three years ago, I purchased Armadillo Mining Shop in Grants Pass, Oregon. Uh, the store had been in business for about 25 years. Uh, it's actually the largest store uh, of its type in the country, uh, which is quite a testament to the gold mining in uh, Oregon itself. One of the largest groups of small-scale miners is those that come into the area during the mining season. The tourist aspect of gold and gold mining and the hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of dollars that are brought into the local economy uh, is, is quite tremendous. Uh, many people uh, buy RVs locally. Uh, many people uh, rent spaces to park their RVs. A lot of people just come and use the local hotels and the restaurant services, gas stations, grocery stores, all the support services all uh, get additional support from these small scale miners that uh, come into the area. Another group of people that we've been seeing, especially as the national and local economy has been sliding, is those people that are either unemployed or underemployed 
mainly from the construction industry, good, hard-working, solid people that have families that they need to take care of, they've been looking at other ways of uh, producing an income as uh, the construction industry is in a terrible slump right now. They've, they've looked into gold mining as a method of supporting their families. Um, these are people that don't want to be a burden on society. They are proud people and they're strong people and they, they want to take care of themselves and their families. And we really appreciate people with that type of integrity. For most miners, they actually do that on a piece of property that they have gotten a mining claim under the 1872 mining law. And these properties are typically in uh, the National Forest System or on Bureau of Land Management properties. One of the assaults that the mining industry has seen is a continued closure of these properties through either mineral withdrawal, uh, through national uh, monuments, uh, through scenic river systems, through wilderness areas, as millions and millions of acres have been set aside for these specific purposes. Uh, they have excluded mining as activities that are allowed in those areas. And most of the properties that are being withdrawn are highly mineralized, highly prized properties that not only contain gold, but contain iron ore, contain silver, chromium, molybdenum, platinum, many other commercial metals that our country relies upon. An increase in the number of laws and regulations from an environmental standpoint have also hurt the mining industry uh, tremendously. In today's mining industry, most mining companies and individuals are excellent stewards of the land. They spend a lot of time and a lot of money to make sure that there's not environmental damages done during their mining activities. Over the last uh, 20 years, there's been a continued pattern of closing the access roads into public lands. These aren't new roads. These aren't new roads being cut. Uh, these are existing roads, many of which were put in as uh, fire fighting roads as they decommission the roads to stop the public from entering the forest. They're also making it impossible for their own firefighting crews to go into the forested land to save uh, the forest during a fire. But it's another attack on mining as maybe the land is still open and available for mining and exploration but when your access is cut off to that land, the effect is the same. It takes that land out of potential production. And as we curtail the uh, production of minerals, we are uh, reliant more on imports. And imports take money out of our country instead of adding value into our country.